Shalom, Hallelujah. We are now broadcasting from the Elat Prayer Tower in Israel, and this is a historical webcast. It is a webcast that is done as walking the extra mile with the nations in the midst of the holiest day of the biblical calendar year, Yom HaKippurim the Day of the Atonement. We are going to speak today about Yom HaKippurim, the Day of the Atonement and what it means. We're going to talk about the Book of Life and we will talk about the judgment of the nations. This is a very important issue because Yah in the prayer tower has been waking us up. Today, personally, I was waking up. I mean, I couldn't sleep really in the middle of the night. The Lord did not let me sleep. And he downloaded on me more about the judgment of the nations. And you need to hear this because if you catch the message, Yahweh can use you to avert judgment if you do the right thing for uh, many people and even many nations. So you need to hear this all the way through to the end. We are going to be here together for probably three hours. We're going to cut the webcast an hour every time after an hour for just about five minutes and then we will go back online again and we're going to go all the way to sunset in Israel which is about 7 p.m. where we're going to blow the last shofar the word of God talks to us about the last trumpet being the time of the resurrection and indeed Yom HaKippurim is the time when it is over after the fasting after the affliction of souls after the ten days of one repentance the last shofar is blown at the end of Yom Kippurim, declaring resurrection and declaring life to those that Yahweh has written in his book of life. We're going to talk about who is going to be written in the book of life, a very important subject because many people are under misconception, both Jews and Christians, about who is going to be written in the book of life. There's been many doctrines about once saved, always saved, and that comes from replacement theology where about uh, many preachers have been preaching throughout the nations that it doesn't matter what you do, God loves you. And therefore, they don't take into consideration what he himself said, the words of Elohim. We're going to return to you today, the word, what the word says about this. And I believe it's going to be a wake-up call. This particular webcast is a wake-up call for repentance to the nations. Understand that when Yahweh calls to repentance, it is actually because he desires to pour out his mercy. That's the reason. He desires to pour out his mercy in the name of Yeshua. That's why we're doing this webcast. And that's why we're talking about the judgment of the nations on a holiest day of the biblical calendar today, the day of Yom HaKippurim, the day of the atonement. Let's go directly to Leviticus 23, and we're going to read about this particular end of a 10-day feast that starts with Yom Teruah, the feast of the blowing of trumpets, or the memorial by the blowing of trumpets. And we are going to uh, read all the way uh, from verse 26. Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. And you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to Yahweh. You shall not do any work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before Yahweh your Elohim. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. As for any person who does any work on this same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no work at all. It is to be a perpetual statue throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It is to be a Shabbat of complete rest to you. And you shall humble your souls on the ninth of the month at evening, from evening until evening, 
you shall keep your Shabbat. This year, Yom HaKippurim falls on Shabbat, which is as a double strength. Yom HaKippurim itself is the biggest Shabbat a year. Not only because it fell in Shabbat this year, because sometimes it doesn't fall on Shabbat, but because it is the day where we are called to cut everything off. And in Israel, everything is cut off. If you walk on the street, you will see not one car. All the shops are closed. Uh, or most of the people are in the synagogues. Even those that during the year never go into a synagogue, on Yom Kippurim they will be in a synagogue. Even people that never fast and smoke and cuss, on Yom Kippurim they will put on white raiment and they will go to pray and they will be very careful on this day. Because they know that this day is a day that can either lead to a place of complete judgment or a time of complete mercy. Now we need to go back to when Yom Kippurim used to be uh, celebrated and kept in Israel 2,000 years ago prior to the coming of Yeshua. Yom Kippurim has definitely changed since the coming of Yeshua because Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lamb of Elohim, the perfect Lamb that has taken away all of our sins so that we can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, since then there is no other atonement but the blood of Yeshua and unfortunately millions of people are under the misconception that they can receive atonement only if they pray and only if they fast. That's not enough. Indeed this day calls for fasting and even for total fasting and it calls for humbling of our souls and for repentance but the truth is that without the blood of Yeshua no one, not even any Jew, not the biggest a justice Jew can be written in the book of life. But on the same hand not any Christian can be written in the book of life because of tradition or religion. Uh, in other words, it demands a personal relationship that has brought about a complete, complete uh, deliverance from our sins so that we can be written in the book of life. And we're going to see that the word of God is amply clear that there are some people that are written in the book of life but they can be blotted out. And we're going to talk about it as well. Very important webcast, historical one. And I do pray that you will share it with many of your friends. Because not only for today, but for the days to come, the words I'm going to speak are going to be very meaningful for your well-being and the well-being of your nation. Let's go now to see how Yom Kippurim is actually kept according to the Torah prior to the coming of Yeshua. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. And we're going to read from Leviticus chapter 16 about Yom HaKippurim. It says, Now Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they had approached the presence of Yahweh and died, Yahweh said to Moshe, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place, inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, and he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with a linen sash and attired with a linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering which is for himself that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two goats and present them before Adonai at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Yahweh fell and make it a sin offering. In Hebrew is Korban Asham or Korban Chatat, a sin offering. 
but the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Can you share with me the scapegoat? The scapegoat. Important subject. Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his household and he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before Yahweh and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire for Yahweh that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony, otherwise he will die. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out. Then he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. For himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before Yahweh and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it and from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrate it. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. In Hebrew it says that the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a land of judgment and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. He shall bathe his body and basically he finished his job once a year going to the Holy of Holies with a bull for his own atonement and for his own household a ram and a goat for the people of Israel's transgression and a living goat that is a scapegoat that all the sins are confessed over and he takes all these sins away into the desert, away into a place that is cut off from the rest of the people. A place of judgment. Yeshua fulfilled all of them. He became our great high priest. It's enough to go all throughout the book of Hebrews to understand that Yeshua fulfilled completely the feast of Yom Kippurim by becoming himself the great high priest. He became the sacrifice. He became the goat. He became the bull. He became the ram. And he became the live goat on which all the sins are put when he was hanging on that cross. The reason why he actually gave up the ghost or he died is because all the sins of mankind were put on him while he was alive. Because he needed to be still alive as the scapegoat so that he can carry the sins of mankind alive. It's only when he had all the sins put upon him that he basically couldn't take it anymore because he had become a curse 
and his father's presence had been removed from him and that's why the cry after he became the scapegoat was a living scapegoat was Abba, Abba, Lama Shabachtani. Father, Father, in Aramean, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because the Father could not remain in the Son when he became like the snake on the pole, while he became sin himself. Of course, we know that because he was totally a sinless lamb, his own blood, right after he became the scapegoat, then we know that he gave up the ghost, and then his blood that was pouring out of his nails, the nails in his hands, the crown of thorn, and even also uh, his legs, his feet, and of course when the Roman soldier, after he had died, very important we know it's after he had died, after he had fulfilled the job of being the scapegoat, then the Roman soldiers pierced him on his side, and blood and water came out. And of course, that blood that came out atoned even for him, because he had become sin himself. So, he is the high priest, he is the sacrifice, every kind of sacrifice for Yom Kippurim has been completely fulfilled in him, He's the high priest, he's the sacrifice, and he's the blood of the sacrifice. Everything has been poured out for him. And he is the only way for both our sins and the sins of mankind to be fully and completely, completely, completely forgiven. He's the only one. Nothing else can help. Now, in this context now, we understand that something great has happened. Very great. And yet there are millions and millions of people, both in Israel and the nations, that have rejected the true sacrifice of Yom HaKippurim. And so we are standing in the gap today for all those both in Israel and in the nations that have rejected the sacrifice of Yom HaKippurim, Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of David. In Isaiah chapter 53, him being Yom HaKippurim is very, very clear, directly from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Holy Scriptures. We cannot fail to see that he is the sacrifice of Yom HaKippurim. And it says clearly here, in verse 6, Let's actually start from verse 4. Surely our griefs himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of Elohim and afflicted. But he was pierced through. That's crucified. He was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The weight of sin as a scapegoat crushed him and crushed his heart. He was pierced through, the blood poured out of him. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. In other words, all the judgment that we deserved fell upon him so that we can be in well-being. Those are the good news. And by his scourging, we are healed, or by his stripes, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. In other words, we can see very clearly the scapegoat, don't we? He has, called, he has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And that is exactly what the scapegoat did. The scapegoat received all the iniquity of the people. It fell on him. Now we are going to continue reading this. And it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth just like the goats didn't open their mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. 
And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Now I'm going to explain this because it's very cumbersome. But what it really says in the Hebrew is this one. Exactly the same word that is used for the scapegoat when he's cut off and sent into the desert is spoken here about Yeshua. The word is nigzar, uh, meretz He was cut off from the land of the living. And in Hebrew, in Leviticus 16, it talks about the goat going to Eretz Gzera, to a place where he's cut off from the rest of the people. Exactly the same words. And then it says that he basically gave his soul, he poured his soul for the transgressions of the people. But the Hebrew says that he became a sacrifice or a guilt or a sin offering, exactly as what the Word of God tells us in Leviticus 16, that there is a goat for the sin offering and there is a goat as a scapegoat. Yeshua fulfilled all both of them. The both goats were fulfilled in him. Now, throughout Israel today, as people are fasting and praying and afflicting the souls through fasting and prayer, humbling themselves by fasting and prayer and going to the synagogues, I can tell you that People, and many people are in dread whether they will be actually written or not signed in the Book of Life. Right before Yom Kippurim, people began to wish each other Gmar Chatima Tova, which means may you have a good signature. In other words, may God sign you into the Book of Life. Without Yeshua, there is no signature in the Book of Life. And we're going to go now through the scriptures to take a look at the Book of Life for a moment. First of all, do we know that a book of life exists? We're going to go right there. And the first thing we're going to go into is Exodus 32, 32. And we will remember when Moshe, Moses, was interceding for Israel. And this is a note for all the intercessors among you. Of the kind of serious intercession that Moses was doing for his people Israel. When they had seriously sinned with a golden calf. And Yahweh wanted to cut them off, all of them. He wanted to destroy the entire nation. And he said to Moshe, I'm going to start a new nation with you. And this is what Moses said to the Almighty in verse 32, 32. But now, now let's go actually from 30. On the next day, Moshe said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moshe said, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Is that amazing? In other words, he was willing to die because in order to make atonement, the whole scripture talks about the only way to make atonement is through the blood of a perfect and sinless animal. And he was willing to basically die, just like Yeshua died. And he went up and he says, perhaps, he wasn't sure about it, I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moshe returned to Yahweh and said, alas, these people have committed a great sin and they have made a god of gold for themselves. How many have made a god of gold for themselves in these end times? Something to think about. Because many people do not see any more golden calves around, but you do see people that have made gold their God, or money their God. But now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. What was it that Moshe was saying to Yahweh here? He was saying, I am not willing to live if my people will not live. What kind of love was driving this man to say something so serious? I am not willing to block me out. In other words, let me be the sacrifice for them if you will not forgive them. That kind of intercession obtained a pardon that nothing else could obtain. Understand that Yahweh was ready to destroy all of Israel at once. Beloved, the only kind of intercession that can obtain such a pardon 
is an intercession when we lay down our lives for the subject we are interceding for. Nothing else can really work. And in verse 33 it says, But now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. In other words, Yahweh has a book that he has written. That is the book of life. We're going to continue seeing it, but remember all the way from the Torah, we see the book of life. It's not only in the New Covenant portion of the scriptures. It's all the way from the Torah. Whoever, and this is what Yahweh says, Yahweh said to Moshe, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then Yahweh smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. So what did Yahweh say? I said, no, I'm not going to blot you out because you don't deserve to be blotted out. But I will blot out those that have sinned against me with the issue of the golden calf. Nevertheless, and I will not totally destroy the nation. In other words, it's not like he allowed the sinners to stay in the book of life, but he spared the nation's total annihilation. And we know that they walked 40 years in the desert and they died. And then only the second generation, we see Joshua generation, we call it. Besides Joshua and Caleb that belong to the whole generation, they got into the promised land. But all the other ones that sinned in the issue of the golden calf, all those were blotted out of the book of life. In other words, automatically Yahweh had all the people of Israel in the book of life because they are his people and because it's a covenant keeping God. But because of their sin of idolatry, he blotted out many people out of the book of life. Now let's continue some more things about the book of life. And we're going to go now to the new covenant. Um, no, actually, no. Let's go to Deuteronomy 29.20. I believe we're going to see something else in the Tanakh here also supporting the fact that there is a book of life and that we need to be concerned whether we are written it or not. So here it is. After Moshe explains the blessing and the curse and uh, Yahweh is talking about Israel and about the importance of keeping the covenant and obeying Torah, he's talking about those that will decide to be rebellious and disobey. And in Deuteronomy 29, 20, it says this. Now, actually, I'll read from 19. It says, it shall be when, they, when a person hears the words of this curse, and he will bow, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to destroy the watered land with the dry. Yahweh shall never be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of Yahweh and his jealousy will burn against that man, and every curse which is written in this book will rest on him, and Yahweh will blot out his name from under heaven. In other words, when people hear about the option towards the blessing or the curse, and people uh, defiantly say, I don't care. I don't care. I'm just going to continue in my stubborn ways. Yahweh says that every curse in the book will fall upon that person that is defiant and says, I don't care. And that he will blot him, his name, from under heaven. In other words, he will again blot his name from the book of life. Now let's continue reading. Let's go to Philippians 4, 3 and 4. In the New Testament, we have many scriptures that talk about the, um, the book of life. So Philippians 4, 3 and 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 3 and 4. Okay, I see that I have a mistake here, so please forgive me. I do not find here the one with the book of life. Ah, yes, it's right here. Yeah, yeah, three. Here we go. 
It says, indeed, a true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose name are in the book of life. In the Philippians, we can see that Paul is talking about fellow workers in the gospel, that their names are written in the book of life because they have accepted Yeshua and they have followed in his footsteps. And the outcome of somebody that is written in the book of life is rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And so when we know that we are written in the book of life, we can enjoy true joy. If we are not sure about it, there can be no joy in our lives. Therefore, it's so important that you know how we are written in the book of life. Now, let's go to Revelation 3. And we're going to stay in the book of Revelation quite a bit. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 5. It says, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garment, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we're talking here about the angel of the church of Sardis. And it talks about strengthening that which remains. And it talks about Yeshua coming like a thief in the night, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment and wrath coming like a thief, like a thief in the night. And then it says, he that overcomes. Now this is very important, we need to keep this word overcomes. It's not only him that started the race, but him that finishes the race is the one that will not be blotted from the book of life. Can you say with me, start, start. And, start. Finish. and finish. Many people have started, but they've stopped in the middle and they've gone into sin or into ruling their own lives and they're not going to finish. And those that are not going to finish will be blotted out. He says, if you overcome, I will not blot you out. If you don't overcome, I will blot you out. Overcome what? Overcome sin. Overcome temptation. Overcome the desire to give into your flesh to run away from the truth. Overcome temptation. So let's go now and that we have proven both that there is a book of life and that people can be blotted out of it and that the believers on Yeshua that are actually written in that book of life, they can be sure of their salvation as long as they keep close to Yeshua. The moment that they actually decide to leave Yeshua, then they are blotted out of the book of life. That's pretty serious. At the end of the day, they will be blotted out of the book of life. And that's where our job as intercessors is to come and intercede like Moshe and cry out for mercy for them. So let's go now to uh, Revelation 13.8. Revelations 13, verse 8. It talks about the beast. And it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone is destined for captivity to captivity, he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So what is it saying here? That when we have the time when the anti-Mashiach is ruling, and the mark of the beast is imposed among all the people of the earth so that they cannot buy or sell until they carry the mark in their hand and in the forehead, then the Word of God says that those that are not written in the Book of Life from the foundation of the world will actually have the mark on them. However, we also see that Yeshua says that even if there are people that are in the Book of Life from the foundation of the world, they can be blotted out of that book in the same way that all of Israel was in the Book of Life and they were blotted out after the golden calf experience that Moshe interceded for them. So we have a situation here 
that even if we would be on earth during the time of the anti-Mashiach ruling, and even if we would be on earth at the time where we cannot buy or sell, but if we have the mark of the beast, it would actually confront every person whether they love their own lives more or they love the kingdom of Yah more. It will confront everybody because think about it for a moment. If you go to the supermarket and you're hungry and you cannot buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast, what will you do? Will you take it so that you can eat or will you rather starve to death or trust Yahweh that it will give you food even by the ravens? But even if you wouldn't bring you food, what about you simply die? That's going to be what we're going to be confronted with if we are on earth during that time. Now, I personally believe that that time is the time of the wrath of God on the nations, but more on that we can talk afterwards. Uh, and I believe personally that those that are faithful to Yeshua are going to be like at the time of Noah's protected during that time and taken uh, to another place of hiding during that time. Okay? That's what I believe. And the scriptures support it, but this is not my message today, but just for you to know that whether we will be down here or not, even if there are, let's say, lukewarm Christians that decided not to repent and they were not taken in the first lift, and they will be down here, they will be confronted this time seriously with a lukewarm because they're going to have to choose to either lose their lives and not take the mark of the beast or keep it and take the mark of the beast and be blotted out of the book of life. So now let's continue taking a look at this and let's go to Revelation 17, 8, which is also about the mark of the beast. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. And so it talks again about those that are not blotted, that are not written in the book of life, will automatically worship the beast. In other words, those that are written in the book of life and they still remain down here on earth for some reason or another, maybe they defaulted, they didn't repent on time, but they were written in the book of life, they accepted Yeshua, they are these prodigals. Same thing with Jews. Those that are not written in the book of life, they will automatically flap into the flock into the beast. They will flock into receiving the mark of the beast and it will be a clear thing. Even today, actually, they say it's more convenient. Many things have become very more convenient nowadays. So people will go for that which is convenient so that they can buy, they can sell, they can eat. But that will, of course, keep them blotted out of the book of life unless some people repent because of the other believers that are down here on earth. Now, I believe that all of Israel is automatically written in the book of life, but it's blotted out because of their sins and because of rejecting Messiah. Just like all of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, all of them were written in the book of life, automatically, because of being in the covenant. Uh, hallelujah, the blood of the covenant through Abraham, but they were blotted out because of their sin of the golden calf. Now the same thing when we go to Romans 11, let's go to Romans 11 before we finish here in, uh, um, in Revelation. And uh, we are going to read in Romans 11, 25, it talks about Israel being written in the book of life, basically. Uh, that's what it is when it says in Romans 11:25, it says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. For all of Israel to be saved, as written, all of Israel must be written in the book of life by the covenant. But, unless Israel accepts Messiah, 
they will not be able to remain in the book of life. That's basically the point here. In other words, the book of life is where all the covenant people from the foundations of the earth, Yahweh has predestined people that are his covenant people that are written in that book of life. But through sin, and unrighteousness, they can be blotted out of that book. The people of Israel have been blotted out of that book, and that's the reason why so much judgment fell upon us in the nations. We became like the scapegoat of the nations, because as a nation, we rejected Messiah 2,000 years ago. When we rejected Messiah 2,000 years ago as a nation, there were thousands that believed in him, but as a nation, uh, like Nineveh, for example, the whole city went into repentance, and the whole city repented before Yahweh, from the king to the dogs. In Israel, there were thousands that believed in Messiah at the time, but the, the leadership and many others, they rejected Yeshua, and they immediately were cut off from Israel on year 70 AD by the Roman armies, by General Titus, they were cut off of Israel and they were sent out to the nations and they became the scapegoat of the nation. No matter what happened in the nations, Israel was blamed for it. Now, what happened to Israel is because they did not accept Yeshua as the scapegoat, they became the scapegoat because they remained in their sins and they carried the, we, we carried our sins to the nations and therefore what happened is that we were under the curse and under judgment rather than under grace and under blessing. And this is where replacement theology actually, through the eyes of replacement theology, the church of the time that had cut itself off from the Jewish roots and from the Hebrew foundations, they interpreted that because Israel is under a curse in the nations, cut off from the land of Israel, like the scapegoat carrying their own sins because they did not transfer it to the cross, to Yeshua as a nation, that actually Yahweh had actually given up on Israel and it was finished with Israel. That's where it went wrong and coming from that misconception they began to behave with the Jewish people in despicable manners and uh, humiliate and murder Jewish people in the name of Jesus Christ. Not because Israel was not to blame. And this is a very important factor that we are going to actually talk about this particular factor even as we go into the second part of this webcast of Yom Kippurim, where we are going to take two chapters that we're going to read together thoroughly, read and maybe even in prayer, and you're going to see that Israel actually um, wasn't the judgment, wasn't the curse, that God himself punished us seriously, but he now has a terrible judgment against all the nations that actually did the actual things or punishments against Israel. Now how can it be that God punished us? On the other hand, the nations are going to be punished because of the, because the word of God says, I was a little angry, but the nations took it a lot further than they should have taken it. And the believers among the Christians, instead of standing in the gap for Israel, not to be blotted out of the book of life, instead of interceding, they went into humiliating and murdering, which is totally opposed to the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. And so they actually rejected the mother, even though the mother was bad, was fallen. But imagine yourself having your mother fallen, really fallen, in bad shape, a prostitute, okay? Your mother has become a prostitute. If your mother becomes a prostitute, what will be your relationship to her? Will it be humiliating her some more? Hmm? Will it be murdering her, killing her because she's become a prostitute? Or if you are a believer, you will be on your knees and you will fast and you will pray and you will intercede for your mother to return and be in the book of life. See, the Christians divorced from the Jewish roots, full of replacement theology. Instead of taking that stand with Israel, their mother, they took the stand of the judge and the only judge of the universe is God himself. And therefore, because of the Christians, the church, is under the church of that time and throughout the generations all the way to the Shoah. That church actually has put the, judge, the, the nations in a place of judgment for the end of times. We're going to talk about it later because it's very important how we are going to act intercede from now on concerning Israel and concerning the nations. So, before I finish, this is just like a, a little side uh, sidetrack that is not really a sidetrack but rather letting you know where we're going from here 
so that you don't dare to escape the truth, but rather listen to it, because you need it desperately, your nations need it desperately. Uh, unless we know the truth, we cannot be made free. So we are going to now go back to Revelation and see some more about the book of life. Okay, let's go to Revelation 20 verse 12. And in Revelation 20 verse 12, the word of Yah tells us, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Mm. You know, many times we don't understand that even though we are in Yeshua, we are still judged according to our deeds. See, the blood of Yeshua allows us to start a fresh new life with a fresh new heart, with a fresh new spirit, with the Torah written in our heart. But if we insist in sinning, then we are going to judge according to our deeds. It's plenty clear in the scriptures. Let's go to Revelation 20 verse um, 15. And it says, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we need to know that our names are written in the book of life. And I'll tell you, I believe the biggest murderers are the pastors that preach to the people once saved, always saved. They are the biggest murderers. I know that they come out of a place of ignorance and maybe even stubbornness. But when they say, don't matter what you do, if you're a homosexual or a lesbian, or a, whatever you are, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, and he has become your savior. It doesn't really matter how you live. Because all your sins, past and present and future, are under the blood. So it doesn't matter what you do. Your sins are under the blood. That demonic doctrine has murdered more people than I believe have come out to the pearly gates and have been rejected and thrown directly into hell. Amen. I'm concerned. Because there's too many millions of Christians worldwide that are still preaching once saved and always saved. Why then would Paul work out this salvation with fear and trembling? If once saved, always saved, who cares? We're going to read about this some more. Let's go to Revelation 21, 27. Revelation 21, 27. It says, And nothing unclean, and no one, who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, the New Jerusalem, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will not have nothing unclean on them. They will not practice abominations, which is immorality, homosexuality, lesbianism, all kinds of things like that. And they will not be liars because no liars and no abominators will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, for us to really know this even clearer than that, let's go back to uh, Revelation 21, and we are going to see in verse 8. Since we're in this chapter, let's see what verse 8 tells us. Actually, verse 7. He who overcomes... Temptation, sin, stubbornness, rebellion, persecutions, lack, whatever you will need to overcome. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his Elohim, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, paraphrasing, those that don't overcome, for the cowardly, those that are not courageous enough to overcome, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderous and immoral persons, fornicators and the like, and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So where will they be? All these people, they can call themselves Christians, they can call themselves Jews, they can call themselves whatever they are, New Agers, they can call themselves whatever they will call themselves. 
None of these people will enter into eternal life. None of them will be written in the book of life. And those that were written, if they decided to go there, they will actually be cut off from the book of life. How do we know that? Very easy. Let's go to Hebrews. Together, keep your hand in Revelation. And then let's go now to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll see what Hebrews chapter 10 has to say about this clearly. It says this, verse 26 of Hebrews 10. It says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That immediately does away with the theology of once saved, always saved. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the son of Elohim and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again Yahweh will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is spoken to believers that were in the book of life, but if they go on sinning willfully, the blood of Yeshua will be of no avail for them, and their names shall be blotted out of the book of life. Again, once saved and always saved is a dangerous theology. It keeps people absolutely lukewarm. It keeps people um, just, you know, hakuna matata, relax, who cares, come what may. You God loves me. It's all good, yeah? God is just good, and but he's also good and holy. So this is important that you take it into heart. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation. And we are going to see one more scripture there in Revelation. At the end of the book, all the way to the end of the book, from the start to the end of the book about the book of life. Revelation 22, 19. Actually, we'll start from 18. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. That's about the book of Revelation. If anyone adds to them, Elohim will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. All the curses come upon people that decide to embellish the book of Revelation, make it a nice story. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book and removes the judgment that is in it and anything else, and anyone who takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God, Elohim, will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which, has, which are written in this book. We're taking away part of the book of life, out of the tree of life, lampstands are being removed, um, all that. When we are not overcoming all the way to the end, in the kingdom of God. It's very important this part that I've just spoken because as we go now to the second part, we're going to stop in just a minute or so. As we go into the second part, I want you to know that right now the nations are under judgment because of the sins of the church towards Israel. Maybe some of you have heard this before, but I don't think you have heard it the way I'm going to preach it in a few minutes from now, again, in the second part of the Shion HaKippurim webcast. So stay tuned with me as we go to the second part of the Yom HaKippurim webcast and we begin to read from Jeremiah 30 and Jeremiah 31. You can have already your Bibles open to those particular chapters and be reading them even right now to get ready for that second part of the webcast where you are going to see very clearly more scriptures about the judgment that is awaiting the nations because of the cause of Zion. And if you thought that the last word had been said about it and we've heard about it enough, I believe that you are in error. I've had one time a person that was trying to work with our ministry that wrote me that I've spoken enough about the judgment of the nations and now he doesn't want to hear about it anymore. And I'll tell you what happens. 
What happens is that if we don't want to hear about it and we don't take our place in intercession and in prayer and in restitution towards Israel, is that the Christians of the nations will actually be judged together with the nations that came against Israel. Please stand with me because my desire is to see sheep nations come forth and the church in the nations repent completely and lead the world into the biggest end time revival that has ever been seen. But for that, we need to know the truth and the truth will make us free. God bless you. Stay put. In another five minutes, we're coming back to you.